Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode okay. of the Love Fruit Podcast. And today I am joined by my friend Roshni Karia, who at the moment, I believe, is still living in Thailand and has been there for, I think, two years or more now consistently and has been living in a fruit-based, raw diet, um, vegan. And I met Roshni a number of years ago at the UK Festival, UK Fruit Fest, and... Um, since then, I bumped into her in Thailand, and we reconnected again, and then we decided to, to do the podcast again, uh, do an interview. I thought her story would be great uh, for people to hear, and uh, she's had a very interesting lifestyle living in Thailand, and sometimes just living on the beach, sometimes literally, and, uh, <laughs> and you know, um, kind of living the, the, the dream that a lot of people would like, I think, and... Um, so it'd be good to hear more about that and more about your story, Roshni. Is there anything you would like me to say in introduction to you? Uh, well, thank you for the uh, wonderful introduction that you already gave, Ronnie. And um, yeah, I'm just looking forward to to sharing a bit about the journey uh, into, I guess, inner peace and the fruits. Awesome, awesome. So. Um, I, I, I guess I don't know a lot about your upbringing and stuff. I'm guessing you, you're from England and uh, I'm, I, was it a kind of conventional lifestyle in terms of how you ate, how you were brought up, or was it a bit different? Well, it was it was a bit different. Well, yeah, I'm born and raised in, in England, in, in Surrey, in sort of on the outskirts of London. And it was kind of like half conventional, half not. Because, of course, if you live somewhere, you're going to have a bit of the culture from there. You're going to have a bit of the mannerisms, all the rest of it. But my parents are not uh, born and raised in England. They're both from East Africa. So, and, and their ancestors are from some part of India. So uh, it's, it's kind of a mix of three different cultures then because you've got the British culture from just being born and raised there, then the the East African culture for the fact that my parents uh, grew up there and my grandparents also uh, and then my ancestors before that if you go back far enough um, there's a bit of Indian culture and I, I think that influenced a bit of why I was born and raised as a vegetarian so that was a bit different because I didn't really meet that many people at school who were raised vegetarian right. I was the kind of vegetarian kid uh, yeah all my friends around me ate ate me and my my parents didn't didn't force me into being vegetarian they just simply explained what it was that the the meat came from an animal and they told me what animals the meat came from and then I didn't want to eat it so it was a choice but uh, it was a bit of, that was a bit uh, slightly um, different right so with every right. that I know that a lot of people of Indian background were living in East Africa and were kind of thrown out at one point, especially people living in Uganda. Were they part yeah. of that the diaspora? Or? Yeah, my dad was part of that. So he left Uganda in 1972 um, because of, as you may know, Idi Amin. Um, so Idi Amin decided that he'd had enough of the Asians in Uganda and decided to, to boot them all out. So a lot of them ended up in in the UK. That's, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's my, my, my family and my my mum's side of the family is from Kenya, so she came for slightly different reasons. But uh, my dad's side of the family, yeah, just literally ended up first at September 1972, uh, in a autumn autumn day in in the UK, just landed there. And recently, my dad was telling me it's 49 years, I think, if my maths is correct, 1972, 1892, 2002. 2012 yeah nearly 50 years nearly 50 years so long time uh, but they still they I mean my dad lived there for 17 years of his childhood so still there's some like, I, I grew up eating um matoke which is like Ugandan cooking bananas and things it's like uh, cassava which uh, not I guess not many people in the UK knew at the time but my parents knew about it so that's the stuff I was eating as a kid it was it wasn't vegan it wasn't raw but it was it was vegetarian. Did you eat a lot? Yeah. Of dairy- oh, I guess it is. Vegan. Right. Yeah. Did Did you eat a lot of dairy products? 
I, I I was a bit of a fuss eater when I was a kid, to be honest. I didn't really want to eat that much. I just wanted to drink all the time. So I was a bit of a of a fussy kid to even get any food down me. Um, so I, I didn't. I I guess yeah, we we did eat dairy products. Um, it, you know, milk with cereal and stuff like that. But I I was never really a fan of of uh i just preferred to slurp things to, to drink things but yeah i did eat dairy products and especially more at at university in my first year because being a vegetarian they thought oh the vegetarians don't get meat so we'll put a load of cheese on everything and a load of butter on everything and whatnot and i was catered in my first year so in first year at university before i went vegan i ended up eating quite of dairy products in fact that might even be what made me want to be vegan because i had more dairy products in my whole <laughs> life just in that first year of university where i thought oh my gosh what am i you know this doesn't feel good for my body sure and what were you studying and what was the university you went to so i studied history and i went to royal holloway university of london and it's it's not the prison. People often say to me, like, what, you know, what did you, what did you do? And I'm like, well, I did history. They think I'm, you know, I'm going to say some crime or something. No, it's not the women's prison. There is a women's <laughs> prison called Holloway Prison in London, but it's not the same place. I just thought I'd clarify that. Yeah, and I know that I, I, I don't know a lot about your, a lot about the different jobs you've done, but I know one of the jobs you did was you were a quiz question writer for, is it pointless or one of the, one of the like really well-known uh, quiz shows or was it the chaser or something what, what point this was offered to me but uh, i didn't i didn't do that one yet um it was it was i did a, there was a few there was a few there was the chase and there was a a few others and uh that was an interesting part of my um job history along with being a librarian and, and many other many other things um so it's kind of a different opposite lifestyle I'm living right now but I I'm glad that I was I was part of that I that job taught me a lot and I made some very beautiful friends from it so I'm very thankful for that yeah, yeah. You, you said to me that if there's a question about vegans or about fruit in some of these shows that is a good chance that you made the question yes um well, there was one I think I remember writing. It was about the veganuary. Uh, veganuary is a pledge to be vegan in which month? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, if there's yeah, if there's any fruit questions on there, I may or may not be responsible, but there's a high chance I I very well <laughs> might be. So it's a good when, opportunity. So, when did you start? Um, you saying in university you started to go vegan? Is that is that, is that right? Yeah, it was towards the end of the first year, to be honest when I still had a few months left so I was on a, I was taking a bit of a risk because I was catered uh, first for the first year I lived in halls and I picked the catered accommodation because I thought it'll be easy for me not to cook when I'm bogged down with all the uni work so I I had this catered halls and as I said a lot of the food was very dairy heavy because they thought oh these vegetarians you know otherwise they'll just be eating salad and that's all so they gave us a lot of of dairy products and and things like that and um i think i just something inside me started to say to me this isn't this isn't this doesn't feel good and i remember i went to visit a friend at university i think it was around june and i remember eating this cheese and tomato pizza with her which was a go-to meal for me normally and i i think it was when was it i went to visit her and I, yeah i just remember thinking i i even said i think i even said to her like is it it's a little bit strange, like we're eating like breast milk from a cow. And she says, no, 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 it's, you know, this is normal what people do. <laughs> and I just couldn't, that was the last time I can remember eating cheese because it just felt so, it just felt so strange to me after that. Like, I, I don't know, it had been building, building for a few months. And then, yeah, and at, at uni, it was interesting because they didn't really have, vegan options at all at that point now they do now their vegan options are amazing because i've been there even two years ago before i came to traveling this time and a friend showed me around and they've got more vegan options than non-vegan options which is a miracle because at that time they just about had soya milk in the in the little uni shop so they've come a very long way and 
yeah, it was kind of a bit of a challenge to, to get anything vegan, even if I wanted a potato, a potato with like baked beans on it or something. Oh, they'd already put butter on the potato or something like that. Yeah. And then I ended up eating chips and beans for a very long time uh, because I didn't want, I didn't feel comfortable eating the, the cheese and all this stuff anymore. And then I didn't know the reasons why I was wanting to be vegan. I, I honestly, I, I didn't really, I didn't really know much about it. Um, I didn't really realize that that was what being vegan was. I just had a feeling that this stuff doesn't feel right in my body. So I, I just naturally gravitated away from it. And then later found out about the ethical reasons and the environmental reasons and all the other reasons to do it, the health reasons. Uh, and this motivated me further. But initially it was because of just this, feel, this, this feeling that oh, it doesn't feel good right now to be doing this. The energy didn't feel good of it anymore. Right, right. So it was, it was kind of a personal right, right. mission more than any kind of outside influence. Yeah. In fact, I used to think like vegans were extreme. <laughs> I used to think like, what, you know, why are they, why are they doing this? I used to think it was, it was a bit strange until I started to have this feeling. And I wasn't even really clued up on what vegan meant. It was like I, I had. Some, I'd briefly, I think I'd heard it thrown around maybe once or twice, and I just thought it's people who, who restrict their eating a lot. I really wasn't. I was, I was very ignorant. I didn't have a clue. Sure, sure. Uh, and then when I got this feeling that I didn't really want to be eating these things anymore, then uh, people asked me, are you vegan? And I, I said, well, yeah, I guess I am. If, if, if it means that they don't eat animal products, then yeah. So... It, 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 it sounds like you didn't really, um, yeah, it doesn't sound like you got influenced, but did you start to learn about veganism or go to any groups or meet other friends like that or anything like that? Yeah, this was yeah. it. Yeah, this was it. Like, I actually met a couple of people at my uni who were trying to establish a vegan and vegetarian society. And I got talking to them and they were telling me the reasons, you know, why they why they don't eat this stuff. And it really got me thinking. I thought, oh, wow, maybe that's why I feel like this, because I was vegetarian for ethical reasons. I, I was vegetarian because I didn't want to be uh, harming animals when I didn't need to. Uh, and when I knew I could live a healthy life without it. So when they were talking about these environmental reasons, these ethical reasons, I kind of really felt like, oh, yeah, this is this is why. And then. I, they, we actually stood up in front of uh, all the society members of uh, well, the, the presidents of all the societies of, of this university and and this is what we had to do in order to get the the Royal Holloway Vegan and Vegetarian Society established. Uh, I remember we were sort of re nervously looking at these pieces of paper and reading out and all the society, like I think it's a high percentage of the society presidents have to say yes if, if you want to get your society approved. And they, they passed it. So that's when it was established. And it was a beautiful thing because now I'm sure it's, I've heard it's grown a lot. I've heard it's grown a lot since that time. So yeah. they really, they, they kind of were the first people that raised the ethical concerns to me. And then I realised well, there's a there's a deeper reason why I'm why I'm doing this. And, and along this time, I know you were this time you earlier that you were early, or or you are on or like this kind of path of inner growth. And was that something you were um, um, aware of at, at that time as well? To be honest, when I was vegetarian, not not really. I was I was so consumed in my own little world, didn't really think about much else. There was also a lot of things going on at school and at home. And it was more when I became vegan and even more when I became raw that this, especially when I became raw, that this stuff really started to come up to the top because it just felt like a lot of the brain fog was gone. When I was vegan, I was having a lot of brain fog still because I wasn't exactly eating things that were were healthy for me. I was eating, I was, I, I tell people that I was bread-tarian, which was the truth. Uh, I was really, honestly, I wanted to write a book. People said I should write a book one day called Bread-tarian to Breatharian, but I'm not Breatharian, so I can't really write that book. But bread-tarian for sure. Like, I would eat, drink, sleep bread, like it was my life. Bread was my life. Bread and pasta and anything like that. 
and it, it just I felt very brain foggy and I only realized that this was the case when I stopped having it so uh, I, I wasn't really able to concentrate that much when I was vegan I found it very difficult I was eating onions and garlic and stuff like that as well which I find now makes it hard for me to concentrate so I don't have it but definitely it was more like end of 2017 when I when I was uh, a few months already raw that the spiritual side of things and the inner growth really started to be something more important in my life and how did you start to go towards raw it was kind of the same thing as what got me to go vegan to be honest this this just a feeling inside my heart and my gut and i i was having many health problems at the time of being underweight of malnutrition I had all these white marks all over my nails uh, I was having a lot of brain fog and I was on these anxiety tablets called citalopram which didn't really affect me so well and I was I was on the lowest dose of it but I was still struggling with the anxiety and also sometimes not being able to feel anything at all which felt even worse than the anxiety so I was having a few challenges I was having low blood pressure and feeling dizzy all the time and I was kind of a bit desperate what to do and I didn't really realize that this feeling of wanting to eat more fruit was connected to that desperateness of trying to get myself well again and I'd met briefly a couple of people who were raw one when I did the work away in Spain a man who'd healed the cancer because of being raw and another man when I was volunteering at an ultra marathon marshalling it and one of the guys there who I was uh, congratulating afterwards he told me he was raw and he'd been an addict of alcohol cigarettes and drugs and everything before and he would turned his life around and it was amazing to literally talk to people like this face to face first and it really made me at the time i didn't think much of it but i realize now that it put the it dropped the the drops of water in the bucket It, it planted the seed and a few years later then I was, yeah, I don't know, I just had this feeling like, oh, I wanted, I just felt a pull to, to try and eat more fruits. And I think, I think my case is quite unusual in a way because I didn't really do any reading up on it. I, the first time I read Arnold Eric's book was two months ago. I, I didn't know anything about him at that time. I didn't know anything really about anyone. And it was just these two guys that I'd met by chance that I'd that had told me about the raw food quite a couple of years before so it was just honest it was a feeling it was following that feeling very cool very cool and, and how did it start off for you did you start eating more fruit and it went from there or how did it how did it go yeah it did I, I started eating like I was eating raw mainly raw food until dinner time so I was eating raw food in the daytime and then when I used to get home from work I'd like make myself some cooked meal and gradually gradually it got to the point where okay like in the beginning I was still eating rice I was still eating bread uh, the the dense things and then towards the end of it I was ju- it was mainly oats and it was mainly fruits but I didn't realize that oats were so heavy on my mind and my body because I used to love them they used to fill me up they were convenient I didn't have to keep on eating loads of fruit if I ate the oats and then one time I forgot to put the oats on my shopping list I forgot to buy them and that's the first time I found out that oats weren't the best thing for me and that I could eat a lot more fruit if I didn't eat oats. And that actually felt great without them. Otherwise, it probably wouldn't have happened. <laughs> and, and, and you just went from there and kept on eating raw? Yeah, because it felt so great the first two weeks. I felt like I was, I don't know, I, I felt like a drug almost. It felt like this can't be real. How can I have this much energy to spare? I was going to work and I was feeling so good. When, when's the last time I had this much energy? Probably as a little kid or something. I felt like I could do anything. I felt kind of like invincible. I had, I was just like boundless amounts of energy for this two weeks. And it felt so good. I just thought to myself, okay, let's see how far I can take this thing. If it stops feeling good, I'll stop doing it. But it, it did actually stop feeling good after two weeks because I felt after that like to be honest quite depressed for the next three months because I didn't really realize at the time initially but I had stopped suppressing the things that I was pushing down with cooked food I didn't even know I had anything to suppress and then it just started coming up 
And I thought like, oh, blimey, where's this coming from? Um, I didn't really have much physical detox at all. It was 99% emotional. It was just these, like a real feeling of just not any excitement about life, not wanting to really be alive anymore. Very unusual for someone like me, who most people would probably agree I'm quite an optimist and normally I turn things around quite quickly. If I'm feeling down, it will usually be gone soon. But this was a real knockout. Like this was it just hit me for six. I didn't know what was going on. And then I started to realise that, OK, the fruits is not ca causing this. The fruits is exposing this. And that's when I thought, OK, I'm going to stick with it. Let's see what happens. But it was scary because at times I... It, I guess it could have gone either way. Like, I, I really didn't want to be alive. It was a, one of the lowest points I've ever been to. And, yeah, when the suffering got too much, it went away by itself. But I... And I, I thought I transitioned gradually, and I still had this. But then there was a lot of emotional suffering to come out. Wow. And yeah. did you, and do you have any fears about the diet? Because a lot of people would be worried about not getting enough nutrients and all the rest of it did you have any worries about that well this is the thing my body actually felt good it was my mind that was the mess and i knew that my 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 body wanted me to eat fruits i could feel it and it, it there was no negative body effects from eating fruit i felt i felt so good in my body and so weak in my mind and this was what was quite confusing at first but i could feel that my my body wasn't telling me not to eat it. It was trying to encouraging, trying to encourage me to to keep on eating the fresh food, the raw living food, and so I did. And it was, yeah, it was heavy for the ego to handle, for my mind to handle, because obviously if I start feeling everything, I start releasing it, and this is not what the ego wants at all. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, and, and it's interesting you're talking about the emotional side of it and the main part of it where do you think that came from is that things that um were a, were a real part of your life that you hadn't thought about before or what, what? yeah for sure like I, I now looking back on it obviously when when a little kid is in it they don't realize if they had a turbulent childhood or not because they think that's all that all that there is what they're experiencing is they might may, may think that's what everyone experiences now looking back on it and hearing about how other people grew up and I, I am very thankful for the way, way I, I grew up because it has taught me the most I think it could have taught like it really has taught me a lot and I think the strength whatever strength I have today is, is, is credit to that and sometimes it's the hardest things that make us the strongest they say that the, the tree knows how deep its roots are when there's a storm so now looking back on it, I do think there were many turbulent things that happened in childhood. But I'm thankful for it because, to be honest, unless that suffering happened, who knows whether I'd be where I am today? Because it's the suffering that, for me, tends to be a, a huge motivator. Because if the pain of now isn't that much, we don't feel that motivated to change, or I don't anyway. But when the pain of now gets enough, then we change. And that... The, I, I feel like the experiences I had sometimes in childhood gave me that material, you know, gave me that that stuff to to have build up. So then the top of the bottle can pop, the pressure builds up enough, then it can it can release. And what would be your tips for people yeah. on how to deal with those emotional things when they come up? How how did you manage to deal with it? I think a lot of people would have crumbled and yeah. tried to suppress it. Again. Yeah. One thing I will say as well is that. I, I feel like it's it's never over, you know, like you still have, I still have things coming up now, things uh, from, for example, recent circumstances. And I always, it's so funny what universe I feel it does. It's like, oh, when I think I've got everything together and I feel I've got it all, all figured out, it'll come and it'll pull the rug from under my feet and I don't see it coming. And it just reminds me that, oh, you know, wow, I've got a lot of growing left to do. So by all means, I'm, I'm not done yet and I'll never be done. And... This is the beauty of life that we keep on growing, we keep on learning. So I just wanted to say, first of all, I'm, I'm not, I'm not done with that yet, um, with that, with that growing and learning. And for the tips for people, allow yourself to feel, allow yourself to feel like you don't. It's, it's okay to be upset about something. It's okay to be annoyed about something. It's okay to cry. It's okay to cry. For me, this is a major way to release emotion, to cry, and also to move. 
to to do some exercise to move my body a little bit even if it's just some gentle yoga or it's a little walk or something normally I go running but sometimes if I get in a low point I don't even feel like doing that right now so like at the time so even if it can just be a little walk you know spending time in nature if you're in a cold country it could just be having a little walk around the block or just being barefoot in the grass and just also sitting by ourselves which can be really can be really difficult especially if we don't like the the emotions that are are coming up um but it's just important to i guess to try not to distract ourselves which can be an easy thing to do it can be so easy to you know go out and and do some work or or go out and and spend the time with friends or just spend it not being with ourselves because then we don't have to think about what's going on so it's it's a difficult thing to not distract ourselves but it's worth it because then okay the suffering builds up but then it's gone quicker as well it's released quicker whereas if we kind of drip feed ourselves then and and we distract ourselves and then it takes longer for the suffering to go away but we don't feel it as intensely i often think that there's something about these emotions coming up that the more that people try to suppress or resist them, which is which is the instinct is to do that because resist them, which is emotional of course. pain is like a physical pain as well, and we try and resist that. Yeah. What I don't know if this is your experience, but I kind of see that the more that you just focus on it and confront it, the quicker that it kind of just disappears, and and it's not as powerful as you think, and if you when you're not using food and everything it that's kind of like your only option in a way yes exactly and that's the thing i i didn't even realize that i'd been suppressing my emotions my whole life with food because it's only when i stopped eating that food that i realized this and if someone had even said to me whilst i was vegan or vegetarian that oh by the way you've got a load of unconscious suffering inside you that you're suppressing with food i just said to them no way like are you joking me like i wouldn't have understood i wouldn't have understood what they're saying so I understand as well if people don't get what I'm saying. But I feel that that's definitely what I've been doing. And with the fruit, to be honest, if we don't distract ourselves in other ways as well, there's nowhere to hide. Where can we go? I mean, how much is a cucumber or a tomato or an apple or a mango going to going to satisfy me the same way as a pizza is? It's not. It's not the same. It's not the same. Um, a banana can't be compared to a chocolate bar or an ice cream. It's not going to stop you feeling, but it, it doesn't block the feelings. It allows you to be a vessel so that the emotions can pass through you. They don't get stuck, which in the short term doesn't feel so good because when we're in the suffering, it can really be painful and, and, and feel like a lot of hurt. But then at the same time, it's gone quicker. It doesn't last as long, which, again, when we're in it, we, we, it feels like it's going to be forever. It doesn't We don't know when it's going to go away, and it can be the scariest thing. And I experienced that even recently. That's what I'm saying. I'm not immune to it at all. I go through these things as well even now because even though I'm in Thailand, I've been living here for two years, not traveling. So then when you're living here, you still have the ups and downs of life, and these things still happen, but you just that's the thing when I'm not comforting myself with food I'm forced to feel it and then it's gone quicker and I'm thankful for that and another thing just quickly yeah I realized that the reason why I had all these health issues when I was a kid like into my adolescence as well the low blood pressure the low weight the brain fog and all the everything else was because of a suppression of those emotional feelings because there's such a true saying i can't remember who said it but it, it's like it said that any emotion that cannot be expressed in tears will cause other organs to weep and i believe that is so true wow any see that again any emotion that we cannot express in tears will cause other organs to weep wow that's 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 interesting and you know, um, you know, Roger at the Fruit Festival had a book that was kind of the opposite. It said, uh, what was it? The warmth of the heart will stop the body from rusting or something like that. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I love that. That's beautiful. It's, it's so true. Exactly. It's like the flip side. It's when we give ourselves love, when we see that in a child, when we acknowledge that in a child, 
our body doesn't need to to show us these these uh it doesn't need to have disease anymore because disease and this is it's interesting how that word comes about it's like an uneasiness will cause these physical symptoms and when we when we acknowledge and and make ourselves conscious of the emotional things underneath then the body doesn't have to keep on screaming to us in other ways like look what's going on hey can you notice me can you see me because we've already acknowledged it deep down the root cause sure sure excellent well um okay um so in the story that we've told so far you 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 went raw for a couple of weeks you felt amazing then all this stuff happens for the next three months but you decided to stick with it and what happened after yeah. that did you at, at any point in that time did you try and um reach out get more information from people read books or was it just your own personal kind of experience that you, you were going through it was it was kind of personal experiences and at the time like I couldn't it was funny because you know, I, I thought to myself why is this happening why can't I get a job right now why is this all going pear-shaped but everything happens for a reason I know that if I'd had a job at the time it would have distracted me all the way away from this low feeling it would have given me a sense of self-worth when I had nothing and it was important that I felt as low as I did because it's that that got me to get out of it it's that suffering that that built up enough so that I couldn't put up with it anymore and it just left by itself um if that makes any sense but i i know i still i didn't read any books i didn't look up much on it i i i was quite ashamed of how i felt at the time because i thought like how can this be happening to me someone who is usually quite jolly and upbeat and i i never envisaged feeling like that so i was even i didn't want to even show to the outside world that much that that's what was happening i tried to cover it up and there was still there was still a lot of time on my hands because as I said I didn't have a I was in between the work contracts I didn't have a job at the time despite how how much I looked if something's not meant to happen it won't happen and at the time it wasn't meant to happen um and I was just feeling yeah like having a lot of time to feel a lot of time on my hands this was really important and then yeah when the suffering eventually got too much they either felt like I either die or I change I, don't, I didn't have a choice anymore then it just dropped it it simply got too much to hold on to like if you have something really hot in your hand at some point it will get so hot that you are forced to let go so it was a forced surrender and then I didn't experience that suffering again I didn't not 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 to that extent ever like even now it, it hasn't been that bad uh, that severe and then I finally felt like my mind was in in tune with my body and they were both on the same level because my body felt good from the eating the raw for that long it felt it felt like it was doing some good to it but it was just the, the mind the mind talk and the the suffering so when that suffering went away then finally I felt okay like I'm in balance here mind body spirit and that's when I mean that three months that was the basis for the any spiritual growth really because I started to things, more things started to come to me, more realizations, more insights. So and this was the start of it. Interesting. So you, you felt like your kind of intuition opened up even more. Yeah, yeah. I was getting very interesting dreams as well. Very interesting dreams because I think it was it was the food, and I would have sometimes visions of what would happen, or like if I'd lost something, I would ask myself the night before like oh where's this thing and I have a dream about where it is and then I in the morning I'd go and find it and it was little things like this that it was like a miracle I, I didn't know how this could be but I guess when you start to eat the things that are easier to digest so that not all your energy goes to digestion you've got more energy for other things and this seemed to be where it was going mm. so um when did you I mean I mean how long until you started kind of getting this desire to travel and go somewhere else and things like that? It it was it was soon after becoming raw because it was then that I felt like my lifestyle didn't fit so much with living in the UK because I when you're eating just just fruits I I don't know I felt like I need to I want to live somewhere where this again this was intuition telling me this it wasn't. It wasn't through much else. And I, I did a few workaways before when I was still eating the cooked food 
In fact, that's where I met one of the guys that was raw when I did a work away in Spain. That was slightly warm climate. Then I, I did a six, seven week work away in some tiny island called Lipari next to Sicily in Italy. And that was a beautiful warm climate and I felt so at home there. And then it was finally, the, the, it felt like the cold weather in England really pushed me. Again, it made the suffering get to the point where it was easier to change than stay the same. And I'm so thankful for that because if it had been mild, I probably wouldn't have felt that push. But it really pushed me to to try something else. And it's funny, I went to, do you know the place called Kew Gardens in, yeah. in London where they've got the greenhouse? Yeah. I'd never been there and I went there for my 24th birthday with a couple of friends and I went in the greenhouse. Was it my 24th birthday or 23rd birthday? One of the two in my early 20s. And I went in one of those greenhouses and I felt like I was at home in there. For the first time in my life, I felt at home in a greenhouse in Kew Gardens because it was humid. It was humid yeah. and it felt so right. And I thought, hmm, I, I need to go to the place that, that I don't have to go in a greenhouse to, to feel this environment. Yeah. So it was 2018, November 2018, that I eventually bought one-way ticket to Bali with no planning, no nothing. My parents were horrified uh, in a way that they, they told me that people normally plan this, this thing uh, for many months in advance. And I, I basically took a weekend to plan a, a six and a half month trip. And I, I hadn't even, you know, everything arrived last minute. Uh, my rucksack, my tent, everything. It was a very last minute thing. I didn't know I'd be gone for that long. I didn't know when I'd be coming back. So I just went, I didn't even know the weather conditions. I thought it'd be sunny. It turns out it was rainy season in Bali when I, when I got there because I hadn't planned anything. But even though it was rainy season, I got out of the plane and I felt this humidity and it felt like I was home. It felt like I was home and it felt so natural and so, so right. You know, when you just feel something and it just feels right and I can't describe it any other way, but it, I just knew I was in the right place. This, this environment. I always feel like when I touch down in a tropical place that even when you're, even when you're just in the airport and stuff, it's it's, it's like there's a different smell as well. I don't know if you experienced yeah. that. Like it's it's really yeah, it's different. Yeah, yeah it, it was different and it it just felt so like I felt like I belonged. I felt like I belonged there. And then when I tried to go back to, I went uh, and left Southeast Asia in end of May 2019, and I went back to England. I worked for a month and then I spent the rest of the time, I, I spent some time in, in the Netherlands, I spent some time doing a work away in Spain, which, which I'd been doing for a few few years, my, my lovely host family that I go back to nearly every year. And then I tried to go back to England and I, it just felt so cold, my, my body had acclimatised to the warm weather, this was it. The only reason I managed to live there for 25 years before was because I'd never really been in a warm environment. So I, I went back and I tried to get used to this again. I couldn't even go outside to pick the leaves up. My bones really felt like they were frozen from the inside. And I I felt like I was I was crumbling. And I, I just, my body was really struggling to get acclimatized to that environment again. And it was that suffering that pushed me to make a change because either I accept or I change. So I chose to change, change my environment again. And I came back to Southeast Asia in November, 2019. How did you find out about the UK Fruit Fest and when was it you went there? I think I found out about it somewhere on the internet. I'm pretty sure. Like I'd, I just, I, I actually can't remember, but I think it was somewhere from the internet. I, I, I saw some article or something and it mentioned some Fruit Fest or I'd been, I think I'd been doing a little bit of research at that point. And I just thought it'd be so nice to meet other people that, that kind of had a similar lifestyle but because I didn't really know anyone in England who was doing that kind of thing. I, I really didn't know many people. I don't think I knew anyone who was eating raw like that. And I, I just thought how nice it would be to to share and learn as well. Because I, I, I saw from the previous year that, you know, there were lectures and people looked like they're having a great time and eating great food and meeting other people. So I thought, like, why not? I want to give this a go. And I'm so glad I did because I met some wonderful people there. I met you there. I met some of my other friends there 
And it was just such a nice environment, such a friendly environment and an encouraging environment that you can learn and grow in a place like that. And you really feel a sense of community. You really feel a sense of community. So I was, I was truly thankful for this. Yeah, I think you made so said, glad I found out about it. I think you might have said at the time that it was one of the first times you'd been around a lot of vegans, never mind like raw vegans. Yeah, I mean, I'd, for me, I'd, I'd been around, I, I did have a few vegan friends already and I'd, I'd been to like this vegan camp out and stuff like that, but it was not quite the same energy as somewhere where it's, it's just fruits because, I mean, I, I, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't quite the same energy and I used to be a very, what I would call angry vegan. I, I hold my hands up. I used to be one of those because I was quite delusioned at first and I disillusioned rather disillusioned at first and kind of angry that, you know, how can, how can we let this happen to the animals? How can we let this happen to the earth? And I had a lot of suffering inside me at the time, which I hadn't released yet. And so what I felt inside of, of course, I would project this outwards because what we project outwards is reflection of inside. So I'd get, I'd get kind of annoyed and um, I, I saw this in other vegans as well, but because I was also in this state myself, I, I, I just thought this is normal. Um, so it wasn't quite the same energy as, as, as the fruits. And I, I did have a, a great time at, at these events at, at the time, and it was important. And I, I did have also many vegan friends that weren't angry vegans. It's not like they were all like that. Uh, there was me and then probably a few others. And I understand that we did the best we could for, for our understanding at the time. Um, but it was a different vibe at the fruit festival, completely different vibration, uh, not better or worse, but different. And I, re I kind of needed to experience that. I needed to experience that at the time. And um, let's talk about your travels then. So you started off in Bali and, and how did it go from there? Well, I, it was very easy to eat raw in Bali because the fruits were just abundant. It's like in England, you have pubs in <laughs> In Bali, you have fruit shops. There's just so many of them uh, scattered everywhere. And it was so easy to get the fruits. The hostel I was staying in had a passion fruit tree growing there and a water apple tree growing there. So, you know, you could really just eat fruit wherever you are. And it felt so natural to be in this environment. It felt so good to kind of be eating from the land. And it, it just felt so natural. I didn't have to put in any effort. And then I carried on traveling. So from Bali, I went to Malaysia. Then from Malaysia, I went to Thailand, some different islands in Thailand, and then finally Koh Phangan for four months in 2019. And I, it just it just felt effortless. It, it was a different ball game from England because in England, I was really having to, to try more. It didn't feel so natural. I was eating a lot of avocados in England. When I was in, in, in my six months of traveling the first time round, I think I probably ate avocados twice or three times. I, I really didn't need so much fat. And, and this also felt better for my body because I, think, I don't think I'm designed to eat a lot of fat, but even the avocado can be a bit numbing and a bit comforting when I was freezing cold in England. So you were in Bali for, um, with the first time around was six months and the, you came well, back. I, I was in Bali for one month and then I went to Malaysia for two weeks and then I started to travel in, in Thailand, some different places, Krabi and Koh Lanta and some different islands and Samui and then finally Koh Phangan. So Thailand for most of it, Thailand for most of it. And yeah, it was just really amazing to finally feel in my, in my like I was in my natural environment, which to be honest, I hadn't felt for the last 25 years of my life before. Mm. So, um, um, what was uh, your kind of experience of these places? How do they differ? Um, what what do you prefer? And were you traveling on your own all this time? Uh, well, I started off on my own, to be honest. I, I only had booked the hostel for the first night, so I really didn't know anything. I didn't have a clue. I was a complete beginner. And then I met people in that first hostel who were really lovely. And then we we saw a bit more of, of Bali together. And then I went to a different hostel when those those guys left. And I met some more beautiful people who I who I felt like you know soul family. And it was just it was just amazing. Literally, one door closes, another one opens. You just trust in the universe, and it taught me to actually be able to stand on my own two feet and to trust myself more. 
uh, which is always a good thing, and to trust my intuition. And I, what I loved about being in the East was that it, there was no fear. This was it. There was no fear. There was no police sirens all the time in the background. There was, you know, you could leave your your door open and nothing would would happen. Um, I left my purse somewhere once, and I went back, and it was still there. It was still there. You know, like these little things. Um, just one one time, my friend left his scooter key in his in the ignition of his scooter. He came back. It was still there. We we got spontaneously invited to a Balinese wedding. I mean, I mean where do things like that happen? Yeah. It was a whole different kind of life where people feel abundant because I almost. I, I guess I realized when I was there that the people there, they may not have had much materially, but they were rich in here. They were rich in their hearts, right? They Richness didn't come from having stuff. Richness came from feeling like you always have enough. Yeah. yeah. And so they were always offering outwards to people. They were always wanting to help people who, who were strangers to me. There was a man who helped me fix my tent in the middle of them when they was about to have a monsoon chuck down. He helped me fix my tent with the three last cable ties that he had. And he was a he was a farmer and an artist and he painted and he farmed rice and he saw me in need and helped me. And he 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 knew that I we couldn't even speak the same language. We were just about managing to communicate yeah. with like, you know, sign language, improvised sign language. And I will remember him forever because he literally helped me when I was in such a dire situation. And he knew that I'd maybe, what, what, what could I, what could I, I couldn't give him those three cable ties back that he needed. And he still helped me out. And it's this, this amazing kind of unconditional love that when someone knows you can't do anything for them and they still help you, a stranger, you know, it really showed me that there is more to life than money. Uh, and actually this made me so fearful and I, I've started to feel there that actually strangers are friends that I haven't met yet rather than in England when we're taught oh you know stay away from strangers it was a completely different vibration altogether yeah very cool um so you is this your second time traveling and you've been out quite a while this time around do you want to talk about that it, yeah, it is. And it wasn't on purpose either. But then they say life is what happens when when uh yeah, you're not you're not expect you know not made these plans. That's that's when these funny things happen. And I I didn't mean to be travelling this long. I left again in November. In fact on the same day, twenty sixth of November. Uh it's been the twenty sixth of November for some reason both times, but that's the day I left again. And that was in two thousand nineteen and I haven't been back since. It's been, I guess, in two months, exactly two months, because it's the 26th today. So in two months, I will have been gone two years, which I, I can't believe I'm saying that. And it was a complete accident, a accident, um, universe has other plans. But I was meant to be gone for about until the spring of 2020. And then obviously that didn't happen because of coronavirus. So I've yeah. pretty much been here since since then and my parents and my friends at home were telling me just stay where you where you are you're better off staying in 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 thailand so i i did yeah i mean I've, i i was there at the time at the start of covid exactly and uh, yeah and so i know a lot of people that are still there that yeah <laughs> and i mean literally i arrived about a week Maybe I think it may have even been days before, like yeah, and everything started. It was really bizarre. And uh, when did you go back to when did you go back to England? I'm trying to remember when it was. I know you were here for a good few months. I went back to England at the end of June, uh, or, oh, okay. maybe, or maybe it was start of July because I was going back for the yeah. festival. And uh, yeah. yeah, and the festival took place. Can you? In July. Have you um? Have you managed to eat mangoes since you haven't gone off and put up after eating them for 120 days? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny. I, I did go back and I kept eating mangoes for a while. But um, wow. by accident, it was weird. Yeah. I, went, I went into the garden and I was walking around the garden and I, and I just ate a gooseberry. Totally didn't think about it. Didn't even, there was just a gooseberry <laughs> there. And I think I was making a video and I just 
said like oh here's some gooseberries and i just went wait a minute that's the first thing i've ate that's not a mango and like four wow months. it was so then i started eating other things but um yeah that's that's still like one of my favorite times of eating was just so simple just eating mangoes all the time yeah. brilliant it must honestly it takes the out of things and the, the the having to think about the things it's like if you just wear the similar clothes every day you don't have to think oh what am I going to wear I guess it's the same with the food if you're eating the mangoes and your, your body knows what to expect you know what to expect and it's intensely cleaning that that kind of mono meal I guess and I felt that like my productivity and creativity kind of increased because I think I've got a problem with sometimes reaching for certain foods um Eat like you're talking about the like avocados your- or for me like sometimes the nightshades the tomatoes things like that or or certain things um when i when when it's a distraction you know i i i, I or sometimes it's like some of those things for me are a little bit distracting whereas mango or something like that yeah. is just it's not i don't really find it not stimulating in that way it just gives me good energy like it makes me want to go and do things and like um so i i ended up like i even like wrote a book over there and stuff like that like i got stuff together wow. and I, I was doing more stuff than usual and i felt like really like just no really? distraction or whatever so that's right. something i liked about the mango diet as well did you feel any emotional I hope you don't mind me asking you this. I know you're asking me questions. But I hope you don't mind if I ask you something about that. Did you feel some emotional detox from eating the mangoes for that long? Or I don't think so. I don't think I really did. Um, I'm trying to think if there was, was any specific moment. Uh, and, the, and the funny thing is, like, I went through sort of a breakup at that point as well. So that was sure. all about... That was a bit weird, but it was kind of like I was uh, I was ready for those things in terms of um, I don't I, I don't specifically remember anything coming up, but I did uh, I did a little bit of counselling. I talked to a friend, um, yeah, and, uh, and uh, but overall overall I don't I don't think and I think basically because I'd been raw for so long before that and I'd had times where I'd been on just fruits for a lot. I'd never done like one fruit, but I'd had times when I'd been on like very simple diet for like months or close to a year or whatever. So yeah. I, I, I never, I, I don't think I'd had that, uh, had the same experience there. Um, but yeah, but I, I think that, I, I think I'm quite good at processing emotion fairly quickly now. Like I just, yeah. don't, I don't resist it. I just try and it, like totally, I kind of just accept in my own mind, like, oh, I'm going to feel really bad about this. You know, I just like, like I'm going to feel really like, sad. I'm going to feel really, I just try and like totally yeah. accept it as quickly as possible. I think the mistake is trying to like push it back and deny it. Oh yeah. I've done that enough times as well. <laughs> now I'm, I've learned a little something not not to, yeah, that basically pushing it away makes it last a lot longer. So now it's just feel, feel, feel it to heal it. Yeah. So you're on Kopan Yang now, is that is that right? You're still there? Yeah, I'm still here. I've I've you could say upgraded, but I mean I've it's it's not it's still I'm I'm basically on the beach, but I last time you saw me I was in my tent still, I think. Yeah, so let's talk about let's I... talk about that because when, <laughs> when I bumped into you in Thailand, you had been literally living on a tent on the beach rent free right is that correct yeah yes it was yeah correct four months in 2019 and then four months last year because why not i mean people you think how much people pay to have a view like that i was living like that with a view for for free literally the biggest bath in the world the ocean and uh yeah just getting to really live in nature and I felt it felt so good to be living like this until until it got a bit rainy and then it was a bit of a different story. And I think you said to me, I was asking you about that, and you said when you were living in the tent for so long, you felt like you almost couldn't imagine living in a house again because you'd be so like this is closed by all these walls. This is agree. So I, I still have it now. I still have the same thing now, and that's why I've, I don't know if you can see where I'm living, but it's complete. It's very open. 
and uh, I don't know if you want to have a little look but like I literally I live on like a it's almost like a platform there's oh, wow. I have a little room as well so I, I got them to take the the mattress out because as you know I don't sleep on a bed um but I just sleep on this little platform here when it's not too if it's not raining so much outside or you know it's it's dry and then I'm I'm pretty much living outside because yeah after living on the in the tent for that long it's difficult to explain to people if they haven't experienced it because I'd never thought I'd feel like that but I just found it quite difficult to yeah to live in somewhere with four concrete walls again because I felt like I was trapped and that's why I chose to to come to a place like this as a house it's a bamboo hut it's it's I mean I don't know if many people would even consider it like a house it's literally a bamboo hut and um I I have the the beach right here and and this little platform to to sleep on and it's like being outside but with a cover so if it rains I don't get wet Interesting. beautiful little house excellent um and, and what's your diet like out there and how are you how do you eat on a daily basis okay so normally I will eat like a few meals a day usually I, I used to just graze I just used to snack but then I thought to myself this doesn't feel so good to keep on eating all the time so then I thought usually after yoga or after exercise, I'll eat at around 10 a.m. And then the next meal will probably be around like it's, it's fruit meals. It's usually fruit meals in the evening. Sometimes I might have a salad very rarely. Uh, and yeah, mainly just even in the in the daytime, the first meal, I usually have some juice. I, I, I had a little bit of an upgrade. I bought a juicer, uh, but sometimes I still go to the juice stand. So I'll have like a, a juice and yeah, around like 10, 10 o'clock ish. And then in the afternoon, I'll, I'll have whatever fruit I can basically find. It might be pineapples, might be mangoes or papayas. Right now, the fruit called Champadec is very much in season here. Oh, so wow. we're eating, I'm eating lots of that and it's really nice. It's like kind of jackfruity, but not, I, I don't know how to describe it. Did you have it while you were here? I I didn't, but I've had it before. Yeah, it's ah. slightly smaller than jackfruit, but it's probably best. Yeah, more interesting. Yeah, it's smaller and a bit a bit squishier as well. Um, and it's really lovely. It's like melt in your mouth. It's like honey. I love it. So I've been having that quite a lot. To be honest, I just have whatever's in season, really, whatever I can get hold of. Watermelon as well. I've I always love watermelon. Uh, it's my go-to snack. And then for evening meal, yeah, kind of the same thing. Usually mono meal or um, a salad if I feel like it with a tiny bit of tahini or like, uh, I don't eat tahini very often because it's quite heavy or, or avocado or otherwise just lime. And you ever, you ever this seems to, to do me well. Today, I... Go on. Sorry, sorry. Uh, finish off what you're going to say about today. Oh, I was just going to say today, I haven't actually had anything. Right now it's five o'clock and I haven't had any food or water because I've been actually dry fasting. And I, I say I'm, I'm probably about 98% raw because yesterday I went on a hike and I had this juice that you can buy and it's called Malay and it's pasteurized. I didn't want to take up these big bottles of juice up with me to the mountain and we left at five in the 5.40 in the morning. So I didn't really, I didn't think too much about getting something from the juice shop or like, yeah, carrying it around in these heavy glass jars. I just bought a couple of these juice cartons from from the 7-eleven that are 100 percent fruit they say but i know they're pasteurized obviously otherwise they wouldn't keep and in the past i've had these and they never caused me any issues but yesterday i drank two of them and then last night i felt like i oh, something's gonna come up like i'm gonna chuck up oh, yeah. but luckily i managed to sit up and not vomit uh, but then today i haven't felt hungry and i haven't felt thirsty yet because my body's still recovering from whatever that stuff that previously i used to be able to be okay with it now i'm my body's like nope yep, yep, so yep, 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 yep. Uh, i'm still cleaning <laughs> what about coconut wash do you drink much coconuts Oh, I love coconuts. Yeah, I love coconut and coconut water. And that that meat is actually something that I don't find too heavy to digest. And it's a good source of fat for me anyway. Better than avocado, better than durian, better than uh, tahini. It's the, the meat of the avocado. It's like quite light, but it's satisfying. And if I need to eat a bit of fat, that's what I'll have usually. 
that's sure. usually good. And what about the Durian? What, what, what's been your experience with Durian and where's been like the best you've got it and things like that? Oh, Durian, I could, you've got to be careful here, Ronnie, because I could talk all day about Durian. Um, I, for me, the best experience has been in, in Kopangan, uh, usually, actually last year, in the, up in the, the east side, where they, like, they have all these farms, and I tried some last year that literally tasted it off lemon, like lemon durian, citrus durian, it, it was amazing, wow. it was really amazing, I had some had some decent durian this year as well, but I wasn't craving it so much this year. I was more eating watermelon, to be honest. And it was still really nice what I, what I did have, but last year has got to be the best one I've ever, best one I've ever eaten. And it was, I don't really have problems digesting it because I don't eat that that much of it in one go. That it's, it's, it's like your body knows, my body knows anyway when I've had enough of it. Yeah. And then if I leave it at that, it, it doesn't, it doesn't cause too many it doesn't really cause any issues for me it's well, it's a bit heavier it's it's a bit more numbing than than a watermelon will be because it's high fat content but still i mean compared to i i, I drank the pasteurized juice yesterday i'm still i'm still recovering from that now and i, I can eat a durian that is much higher fat than that juice but it's okay. raw and it won't do anything big for sure. me so what is that thankful for this what would be like some of your advice then for people who are starting off with this lifestyle and, and maybe as well people that maybe want to travel as well and things like that? What would be some of your kind of advice on that? So I would say about the fruit first, about the eating the raw food, the lifestyle, I would personally say do it gradually because, I mean, I even thought I did it gradually, having been vegetarian for life and then vegan for four years before I started doing the raw because I decided to, well, I, I, I stopped eating the animal products in 2013 and then it was in 2000, at the end of 2017 that I started eating the, the, the exclusively just the raw food. And even then, I thought this was a gradual transition, even then I experienced a lot of emotional detox which may not be the case for everyone but that's what that's what i had and so i think maybe it would be if i was to do it again i would eliminate even slower than that like you know um really take my time with it maybe the biggest difference for me was not having the dairy the the cooked oil and the gluten yeah. and if you can maybe transition one at a time eventually you know not have one of those things not all in one go because otherwise i don't even think it's sustainable and the detox might be so much that it really discourages people so i think better to do it slower and actually more sustainable than just to go raw vegan overnight and then it lasts for a couple of months and then finish um, because the the i mean even sometimes people can feel physical fatigue because their body's finally starting to release the yeah. the physical things for me I didn't feel much fatigue because I think I was I was th there was not as much maybe physically to clean out still a lot of things but maybe not as much as someone who's been eating a standard American diet or standard European diet including meat and a lot of dairy products uh, so gradually would be my advice and I I think yeah gluten is a major one cooked oil and dairy products and obviously meat to, to slowly slowly come out of those ones and even if in the beginning like in the beginning I was eating salt right I was eating this stuff I was having onions I was having garlic this is raw many raw vegans still eat this stuff I, 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 I did that slowly like I it was a while before I stopped having salt it was a while before I wanted to not have onions and garlics anymore there's no need to be perfectionist there's no need to be like 100% Sometimes we need to even have a pizza, have a burger, whatever it is, to remind ourselves why we don't do that. This is important yeah. too. There is nothing, if, we're, if we are kind of um, purist all the time, we might even forget why it is that we're doing what we're doing. For sure. For me, even For yesterday, sure. yesterday that was a reminder why, why I don't want to drink pasteurized juices anymore. And it was important that I did this. And yeah, I will, if someone someone asks me are you 100% fruitarian or raw vegan I will tell them no I never have been and probably never will be because I need sometimes these little reminders okay not pizza or stuff like that because then I'll actually be sick in bed for a week but just like pasteurized juice or a few cashew nuts um, or something like 
something like that that will remind me oh this is why i don't have this actually so do you ever go to the raw yeah. the raw restaurants on copa copanian not anymore really no um because to be honest how many ways are there to cut up a cucumber because what i want is so simple yeah. i just want a bowl of mangoes or a half a watermelon what's the point to go to a restaurant and and have something i don't really want to have for a price that i don't really want to pay and then it's got salt and whatever else in it i just don't see much point there, there is one restaurant called food and roots which does do salad if you ask and and also a really other one really beautiful one called taboon which you know you can i go there sometimes because I, they have a salad that is really grounding with beetroot and, and carrot in it that I don't have beetroot and carrot in my house, but I will go somewhere like that to eat this beetroot and carrot salad with a little bit of tahini in it and a bit of avocado in it for a grounding meal. So I'm really thankful for that. But like maybe, maybe in a month, once or twice, if that, yeah, because yeah. It's, the stuff is just so simple. My restaurant is a fruit shop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what I call my restaurant. But I would say that this stuff is really, really good for other people for transitioning. You know, it's, sure, it's, sure. if I was in England, if they, they had these restaurants near my house in England when I was transitioning from from cooked to raw, it would have been a godsend. So I'm really happy they exist. Just because I don't eat in there doesn't mean I think that other people shouldn't. And I think they're a really valuable thing on this island. And great that people can go in there and eat healthy meals, which which are maybe vegan and maybe don't have a huge load of salt in them like they might do otherwise. Awesome. Or, or gluten free, even stuff like that. Gluten free is 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 definitely a a great step. Uh, and even if people don't want to be raw, just do what's do what they can. You know, anything is something. That's a, that's the advice I would say. Anything is something. Never be discouraged by by just thinking oh that person's all fully raw oh i can't do that it doesn't matter just do what you can even if it's just one raw meal a week this is something yeah awesome it's awesome. something awesome. and about the traveling traveling tips it's cheaper than you think that's what i'd say because everyone was saying to me oh it's expensive blah 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 you know oh, it's not possible it's not possible for a girl to go tra traveling on her own with a, a tent in her hand luggage it's, it's definitely possible if you want it enough because if you do research like I spent a while researching that tent managed to find something and if you if you don't spend a lot in in England like I, I didn't naturally not not because I didn't want to but simply because my lifestyle didn't really require it the amount of uh, price the price that people pay for a coffee is more than I would spend in a in a whole day um, so I, I really realized how cheap it is. Even when there was no COVID, it was pretty cheap. I used to pay 30 baht a night to stay in my tent in a national park that was on a beach in Krabi, for example. So it is possible. And it just depends how much you want it. It just depends how much you want it. And it's you meet amazing people. You have amazing situations. When you trust that, it's all going to be OK. And don't get yourself in dodgy situations. Like, I don't. I don't drink the alcohol. I don't smoke. Yeah. I don't really. I mean, plant medicine, yes. Otherwise, drugs, no. Um, for me, a lot of the money goes on that stuff. Otherwise, so yeah. it's another. It's another thing. It just depends what our priorities are, really. Um, there are things like work away, which you can use to volunteer abroad as well, if you really want to do something good for the, the community and give something back and also have somewhere to stay there's house sitting there's house swaps there's all kind of things possible but the the thing is just to to, to to make the step to take the first step which is to to buy the ticket and when you do that everything comes in your comes in alignment everything works in your favor because you took the risk this is the biggest thing so um yeah, that's that's been what I've learned, because if I'd have never left, I'd have never known how easy it could be. And if I can do it, anyone can, because even people used to. I couldn't I couldn't even get on a bus by myself. I was so scared in England of doing everything. Um, so university taught me a lot to be independent and and also, yeah, traveling taught me a lot that you can rely on yourself. You can do it. You can face your fears and when you face them you realize oh there was actually really nothing there much to face 
it's more in our mind than it than it is in reality so take the risk take the risk and if you want to come to a warm environment believe that you're worthy of it believe that it's something that you can do and it's something that you deserve and everything will conspire to help you do it thank you very much for the chat today and how do people what, what's your kind of plans for the future and how do people connect with you if they want to follow what you're doing or get in touch with you thank you ronnie um thank you for this uh this inter this kind of podcast it's been it's been wonderful and i would say right now i focus a lot on inner work i'm focusing a lot on inner work because i realized that yeah, it, like I was saying earlier, it can be very easy to just distract myself to go out and do some job. And of course, this looks better to the outside world than just sitting meditating all day. Um, <laughs> it looks it looks more like, a, you know, we look like we have more purpose in our life if we're outwardly doing something that other people can talk about and recognize. And right now I'm figuring that out. But more what I'm figuring out is is what's on the inside, because I don't just want to go and do something on the outside if I don't feel good to be alone by myself, if I don't feel good to be happy in inverted commas doing nothing so right now I'm I'm spending a lot of time with myself I'm teaching myself guitar uh, which I which I've been learning for a while but now I'm putting in a more consistent practice I am learning new little some new little skills that can help me to be uh, like concentrated on one thing such as macrame like tying these little knots with things some arts and crafts um, and just generally getting to the point where I make my inner peace, my responsibility so that outside I'm not expecting everything off of everyone. And this is what I feel is the best thing that I can do right now for myself and for the world. Because when you love yourself truly, when you know that you can be happy by yourself, when you get to that point, you don't expect things from other people and you don't grab things from other people, which is what I was doing probably up until recently without even realizing it. So. I've recently had a really big wake up call and uh, I, I feel humbled by it and it's made me, uh, it made me suffer and then it made me kind of realize that I'm, I'm everything I, I need and it's all in, it's all in here, but I didn't know that until recently because only recently I've got a chance to be this alone, to be this much by myself. Um, and so the, the things I'm focusing on right now, I want to share my, my poems and my writing. I've been writing quite a lot recently uh, because sometimes when you have these experiences, they give you little insights as well and you start to write. So uh, I've got a few things that I've uh, got to share on my, my website, which I recently made. Um, it's, it's called Radiantly Roshni. Maybe I can give you the link for it. Um, and I share these things on Instagram as well. But right now, yeah, for me, it's a lot about personal growth and inner growth and taking that time to really get to know myself before I do a lot in the outside world, because otherwise for me, this is just doing it out of distraction and doing it to get a sense of self-worth because I want to make sure that sense of self-worth is there from the start, whether I'm doing, even when I'm doing nothing, basically. That's really great, Roshni. So radiantly Roshni on Facebook, <laughs> Instagram and your website as well. well we definitely will put some links below well, thank you for joining thank us you. today I look forward to seeing you again and um uh, really i think that's been a really helpful and interesting podcast and it's always good to hear about someone that's sticking to a mostly almost entirely fruit diet as well it's really great um thank you very much and thanks everyone for awesome. watching and listening uh, we really encourage you to maybe share this with other people you think it might help you can go to fruitfest.co.uk uh, to join our newsletter for new, more new notifications and to learn more about the Fruit Festival that will be happening uh, once again for the ninth occasion in July 2022. But also we have a number of other events coming up and other things up. that you might be interested in, so uh, stay in touch. Subscribe to the podcast, okay. send it to others, give us a good rating, whatever you want to do. And thank you very much for listening. For now, see you in the next episode of the Love Group Podcast.